Meep. Okay, so before I even utter one single word about Glass Onion as a film, I feel the need to come out of the gate and just say that there's far too much Ryan Johnson slander on this platform, and there have been some absolutely lizard brain takes surrounding this film. I hate feeling like I'm giving any ammunition or credence to the detractors of this film, and I hate that I am adding to the needlessly large pile of garbage, especially since I'm once again being a huge hypocrite. So I just want to make it abundantly clear to you that I really enjoyed Glass Onion and that I think it's a great movie. I probably had the most fun watching Glass Onion out of any film in 2022. I was physically smiling during it. I had a blast watching it. I could go on and on about how good it is. And I will. Honestly, I kind of just straight up love the fact that these Knives Out films exist at all, period. I love that I get to be here for this murder mystery renaissance. It's so fun to see it all come together, especially with the cast they bring on for this. You know, the, every actor perfectly rides that particular and difficult line that they need to in order to make the characters and the world of the story feel cohesive, which is only really aided by Ryan Johnson's confident work behind the camera. He really knows how to put together a scene. And I think there's something to be said for the fact that uh, never in Glass Onion, despite everything that's going on, despite every layer of detail, I never once was confused about what was happening or the motivations. I, I was never confused about where characters were, how they felt. I, I really think that you can't overstate how much of an achievement that is in a film with this intricate of a plot and this robust of a set of characters. Ryan Johnson just has this really adept ability to layer in all of this information and constantly keep the audience on their toes while simultaneously spelling everything out for them. It's all right there if you're really looking at it dead center, but just because of the way that he teeters between playing into and against audience expectation and just the amount of detail he puts into his stories, it it just makes the whole thing a blast to watch. And in a way, the film itself is a glass onion. I seriously can't overstate how much I admire and respect the amount of dedication and craft that went into making a film like Glass Onion. Which is why this one thing about it has just been bugging the absolute sh** out of me. But before I talk about that, I do have to issue a couple of huge warnings. One is going to be for spoilers for both Knives Out and Glass Onion, as you probably imagined. Two, I, I just want to warn you ahead of time that when I'm talking about Glass Onion's fatal flaw, keep in mind that this is entirely a personal gripe. Like the this is not an attack on the filmmakers or even on you for just having maybe a different opinion than me. This isn't even a review. I'm not even attempting to comment on the quality of the film. Again, the film is great. If I'm being transparent, I just have to be a little bit playful and hyperbolic for the algorithm. That's just how this works. I I'm sorry. This, this is entirely a personal issue that me, a mortal human being with a camera and a microphone, is expressing out loud. It, I'm not an authority on anything. None of this needs to be personal. So given the fact that Glass Onion is a murder mystery, you're probably expecting me to point out some glaring plot hole, the singular loose thread that unravels the entire mystery. And this is something that Ryan Johnson himself has expressed anxiety about in a conversation piece with Joseph Kaczynski that was uploaded to Variety's YouTube channel. You know, it, it makes perfect sense. It's kind of like a house of cards or like a Jenga tower or something. One thing goes wrong, the whole thing topples over. But that isn't worth dwelling on because that's not at all what I'm here to talk about. To me, the fatal flaw of Glass Onion has very little to do with the actual logic of the piece. It's like, I'm sure there are plot holes that you could pick up on, but at least for me, even on a scrutinous second viewing, I found all of the setups and payoffs and all those small little details you don't notice the first time to be reasonable, fair, and satisfying. So 
It's not an issue for me at all. To me, the fatal flaw of Glass Onion is entirely to do with the film's structure, especially when compared to Knives Out. Now, this one decision that I'm about to talk about ad nauseum, on paper, seems so minute that I was considering just never talking about it at all, because Knives Out and Glass Onion, while a part of the same franchise, while both being Benoit Blanc mysteries, they're intentionally different films, and I didn't think that the structural comparison that I was making was necessarily fair. Until I watched that conversation piece between Ryan Johnson and Joseph Kaczynski on Variety that I mentioned just mere moments ago, where Ryan Johnson said this. With a whodunit, there's the crime, there's the solution. Where most of the work ends up going, though, is in always remembering that that's not going to hold an audience's interest at the end of the day, that collecting clues and revealing whodunit is kind of a cheap coin, and what's going to keep your audience leaning forward is the same thing that works in any movie. You need a protagonist, you need something you're worried about, you need dramatic propulsion. Daniel Craig plays Benoit Blanc, who's the detective, and he's at the center of these movies. In terms of the dramatic structure of the films, though, he's never the protagonist. The detective is kind of godlike and outside of the sphere of human drama. He's kind of exists out and above it. And always reminding myself that the movie needs a real protagonist, which means it needs somebody in the story with skin in the game that the audience is emotionally invested in. And it's that person's victory at the end that's gonna actually give a truly satisfying ending. And when I heard that, I knew I had to talk about this because if the man himself is talking about it, then it is okay for me to talk about it. So let's start right now fittingly with a concept known as the introduction to the protagonist. I wanna start this portion of the video by talking about Star Wars, which I know is a very dangerous thing to do in this video, but we're gonna be talking about the 1977 Star Wars, the original, because to me, it is the most ubiquitous example of an unconventional introduction to a protagonist, which I know it's lifted straight from the Hidden Fortress, but. We're gonna talk about Star Wars because people know what Star Wars is. So in Star Wars, A New Hope, as it's known today, we start the film with two droids, C-3PO and R2-D2, and we hang out with them for a bit of time as they go through a series of events until roughly about 17 minutes into the film, we meet our true protagonist, Luke Skywalker. C-3PO and R2-D2, like I said, it introduce us to the world of the story they do their job and then they hand the baton to Luke to guide us through the entire rest of the story. And in Knives Out, it kind of happens similarly, but it's a little bit more complicated. Knives Out does a lot more bouncing around. You start with the housekeeper, Fran, then you go to Marta, who is our protagonist, but we don't stick by her for long. She gets to the manor, and then we're introduced one by one to the different Thromblies, the two police officers who are working in tandem with Benoit Blanc, and then it bounces back to Marta, who, again, is our protagonist. She is our lens through the rest of the story, and that handoff happens roughly about 23 minutes into the film. Now, let's compare that to Glass Onion, which yet again is even more complicated. We sort of bounce around between all these different character perspectives until we land on Benoit Blanc, and we sort of start to see the story world through his eyes. But remember, Benoit Blanc is not the protagonist, decidedly so. so even though we spend all this time with him, he's really just acting as that sort of C-3PO, R2-D2 baton pass that I was talking about earlier. And he passes off the baton to the true protagonist of the film, Helen Brand, who we do not meet until literally halfway through the film, an hour and 10 minutes in. I I'm not kidding you, it's literally almost exactly at the halfway point. Now, obviously art can involve math, but a movie is not a math problem, so I'm not suggesting that just having Helen Brand in the film for a higher percentage of time would automatically solve the issue I have with this choice, nor am I saying that it is an inherently incorrect choice to begin with, because it is a very intentional decision that I think achieves its intended effect. Finding out that who we thought was Andy was actually Helen 
is such a crucial piece of information that entirely recontextualizes the first half of the film. It is very much intellectually satisfying in that piecing together the puzzle kind of way. And I, I think that was fully the intention with this reveal, but the unintended consequence of doing this is that it completely cuts out the legs from the emotional impact of the story, for me at least. Again, I know that on paper this seems like such a small, insignificant thing to even complain about, but it had a pretty big ripple effect for me. You know, the, the creative challenge inherent to this choice is that in order to get me to care about this protagonist, you have to do the same amount of work in half of the time, which in Glass Onion's case is about an hour. So I guess that's it's almost the length of some entire film. So it would have been completely doable, but they didn't manage to achieve my full emotional investment in that amount of time. And that's not me saying that I don't care about Helen or that Janelle Monet didn't do an excellent job playing what is essentially a double role. No, I, I do care about Helen. I like Helen but I certainly don't have nearly the amount of investment in her that I do in Marta. Even though Helen and Marta, script-wise, have pretty much the exact same amount of stuff going on, the thing that makes Marta a more investing and compelling protagonist to me is the fact that once we are with her, you know, once all the pieces are in play, once we've gotten to know all the different personalities of the Thrombley family, once we're familiar with Benoit Blanc, once we are in her shoes, we don't come out of them, and the filmmaking is constantly putting us in her perspective. Take, for example, this scene, the scene right after the reading of the will, where Marta finds out that everything is going to her. By this point, the filmmaking has already supplied us the information of how she fits into this family dynamic and what kind of relationship she has with these people. And we already know the guilt that Marta is feeling in this moment. And so, and even through the camera work, let, let's talk about the camera work. We're, we're so used to smooth shots. We're used to either locked in or dolly moves. And then in this moment, when shit hits the fan, the camera suddenly goes handheld. And I'm experiencing anxiety because Marta is experiencing anxiety. When Marta is afraid that she's gonna get caught, I'm afraid she's gonna get caught. When she gets a new piece of information, I get a new piece of information. When she does not know who to trust, I don't know who to trust. And that moment at the end, that brilliant moment where she is smugly drinking that coffee from atop that porch in front of the entire family, my God, the amount of satisfaction I feel in that moment. It is, it is perfect. I feel so proud watching her just quietly revel in her victory. And Glass Onion tries to do the same thing. But getting to that point is a lot more complicated. Because of the sheer amount of shifting perspectives and the vast amount of information that is presented within the film, I never really lost a sense of omnipotence. Like, I constantly felt like I was just floating through the film. I never felt centered around anything. Just as I felt myself understanding the world and the characters, and, and most importantly, the stakes of the story, everything just kind of flipped on its head, which was really fun on an intellectual level. It, it gave me such excitement to see that the film was going in this completely different direction, but but by the time that happens, when we're with Helen, since I'm so in that omnipotent puzzle-solving mode, it is so difficult for me to really fully appreciate what is going on with Helen on paper. And the film knows it. For starters, I think the fact that we see the events play out before we meet Helen completely undermines one of the core elements that makes her story worth investing in. Helen. Her sister has just died, who she supposedly had a very close relationship with, and, and now she basically has to pull off this heist job of not only pretending to be her sister, but do that also with the knowledge that her sister is dead, and one of these people killed her. So there's sort of also this bomb under the table that she has the knowledge that her sister is dead and that this will eventually get out. So no matter what, 
she will be found out. So she has to play this convincing version of her sister to trick all of these people who know her intimately, and she has to do it in a time crunch to get the information she needs to prove who did it. And if I am supposed to feel like Helen, if, if she is the protagonist, she is my emotional lens into the story, I should be feeling this profound sense of dread and anxiety. I should be asking myself questions like, will I be able to find out what happened to my sister in time? What if I get caught? What if I slip up because I'm so angry that these heads killed my sister? What will I even do if I get the information that I need? What happens if one of these people finds out? Will I die? Except none of that matters because we already know how all of this is going to play out because we saw all of it in the first half. <laughs> I've seen the first half of the movie. I know that she doesn't immediately get caught. I know that even when she gets angry and slips up and people are suspicious of her that she makes it out of every encounter relatively unscathed. And I know that it ends with her getting no scope through a window. <laughs> and Obviously, the ace up the film sleeve is, surprise, she's not dead. Huh? <laughs> no way. <laughs> Old Francis took a bullet for you. Yeah, I thought this kind of thing only happened in the movies. So that way she can blow everything up for the big cathartic ending. But aside from that, the structure of the film completely robs the tension and therefore robs my investment in the character. Here's another good example. Andy and Helen's relationship is pretty much entirely wrapped up in one conversation. It's, we get just enough information to feel something for her and understand what's happening, and then we get right out. And it just makes this moment where Helen is looking at her dead sister feel of little impact because I feel like I should be devastated in this moment, right? Especially if I'm supposed to be feeling what Helen is feeling. I, I really should be sad, but in this moment, because of the way that everything is played out beforehand, again, I'm in that omnipotent puzzle solving mode. So when I see this, I go, oh, she has a twin. Wow, so cool. When, again, should I not be really sad? Like, <laughs> is this whole review just revealing that I'm a sociopath? Am I okay? Okay, but but seriously, my entertainment feels like it's being catered to more than my emotions in this moment, and I really don't like that. I, I want to feel the impact of this moment. I want to get more than just a few small morsels of the emotional core of Helen's story. You know, like I said, all we really get is like, Andy and Helen were supposedly close growing up, and then Andy moved to New York, and we can kind of infer that the relationship was a little bit more distant past that point. Andy meets the heads, and then one of the heads kills her. Now she's dead, and it's sad, and, and Helen's angry and wants justice. I mean, I get it. I, I understand what she is feeling, and I do want to see her get that justice, but what I am feeling for her is sympathy not empathy. I wasn't given the proper time or perspective to feel what she is feeling in this moment, and we just breeze right past it all just to get back to a section which on paper sounds like it's supposed to put me in her shoes, but in practice feels toothless and airy. There's no stakes, there's no tension. It's just the same set of story beats I've already seen, but this time with more information. And this all cumulative. <laughs> which cumulatively makes the entire ending fall short of greatness for me. And before I get into that, I do have to talk a bit about characterization. I know Ryan Johnson catches flack for how simplistic and one-dimensional his characters are in these Knives Out films. And, and I don't really agree with that criticism, at least not fully, especially in the case of Glass Onion. Like, all of these characters are very intentionally one-dimensional. It's not exactly profound, insightful commentary to say that the 1% are one-dimensional people, but it at least feels like an accurate depiction and fits into the entire thesis of the piece all the way down to the title. But I think the most ironic thing is that of all the characters in this film that I felt like I spent the proper amount of time with and really came to understand, it's Miles Braun. Now hold on, hold, hold on. Hold on, <laughs> here. 
I'm not saying that I like or empathize with Miles Braun. I am saying that I understand him. Given the amount of emphasis that is placed on him, it probably should have been obvious that he was the killer, but again, the title of the film. Uh, <laughs> no, what, what I'm saying is that in the film, we are given a series of interactions with Miles Braun that are incredibly revealing, both from an informational and psychological perspective. And because of that, I really feel like I truly got to understand exactly the type of person that Miles Braun is. A pretentious, insufferable, rich idiot masquerading as a genius. Now, this is obviously due in part to Edward Norton's pitch perfect performance, but I think it is supported on a technical level as well. The film made me aware of him intimately enough that I knew I couldn't f***ing stand him and that I really wanted to see him get his comeuppance. So I can't pretend like that big finale wasn't incredibly satisfying. I mean, again, I'm, I'm smiling just thinking about it. You're probably seeing footage of it here. It's not next to me here. I'm just thinking about it and I'm smiling. It is, it is brilliant. <laughs> just the slow motion, the embers, the, the the looks on their faces, the Nat King Cole playing in the background. It, God, it is just so good. It is so good. I love it so much. But there's just one problem. One little thing that could have made the whole thing perfect. And that's, you guessed it, being fully emotionally invested in Helen as the protagonist. As it stands, the ending is cathartic in that fuck you Miles Braun type of way, which again, I get a lot out of, but I also get the suspicion that it was supposed to be cathartic in this type of way. Yeah, go Helen. All right, go Helen. But because of everything that I have spent the entire rest of this video discussing, I just didn't feel that way. Again, I understand completely why this is satisfying for Helen, especially now that I'm acutely aware of just how much of a shithead Miles Braun is. But because I didn't spend the proper amount of time living in her shoes, feeling her feelings, it just sort of fell a little flat for me. I liked Helen, but I never loved her. I felt for her but never felt like I was her. And as a consequence, I had a ton of fun watching the movie, but I never felt moved by it. Which plainly sucks because I can clearly envision just how much more impactful and gratifying the whole package would have been, and especially the ending would have been, had this one element just worked better for me. I think I would have loved Glass Onion just as much if not more than Knives Out. But I didn't. To use a Nakey Jakey analogy, <laughs> it's a lot like building a Lego set, but never playing with it, you know? Like, if you build a Lego set, you still get the intellectual satisfaction of seeing all of it turn from just a pile of pieces into a finished creation, but if you never play with it, then you don't get to build those lasting emotional memories that stick with you for the rest of your life. And that's kind of how I feel about this Glass Onion Knives Out situation. Like, again, I really thoroughly enjoyed Glass Onion both times that I watched it, and I think it's a good movie, it, a great one even. But I'm always going to have more fondness for and I'm going to be more eager to revisit Knives Out as time goes on. Again, just to summate my thoughts and make everything as clear as possible, Glass Onion felt like it was more interested in intellectually stimulating me than emotionally engaging me, which isn't inherently bad, like I said, and, and I think a lot of people will probably prefer Glass Onion for that exact reason, and who could blame them? It's a ton of fun, and I'm abundantly happy that the film is getting the accolades and praise that I think it rightfully deserves. You know, despite everything that I said here, Glass Onion is still my pick for best adapted screenplay at this year's Oscars. Again, just to solidify the fact that I am a giant hypocrite, this whole video was basically just a way for me to get this off my chest. And it was a catharsis of my own, but I hope that you got something valuable out of it. And if you did, 
consider supporting me. Maybe follow me on Twitch. I haven't streamed there in a long, long time, but I'm thinking about doing it again soon. But more importantly, go support the newly launched Patreon, which right now is basically just an over-glorified donation box. But uh, if you donate $5 or more a month, you get your name at the end of the video during this portion where I don't know how to end the video properly, and I, I kind of just fail to articulate myself on any level and make myself look like a total ass, which... <laughs> I'm going to stop doing now. Bye.